your potential on your way to doing what God intended for you to do. He will place a lot of, ob uh, a lot of uh, obstacles. But you know what? When you have passion and you know that you have your goal and you have set your eyes on the price, there is nothing that can stop you. It might be family problems that will occur. It might be family losses that may occur. It might even be a terminal illness. I have seen people who have been declared to have cancer, people who have been confirmed to be HIV positive, go on and live lives far more profitable than people who are completely healthy. Why? Because they, there is something inside of them that is passion and that drives them and they will not stop putting, keeping their eyes on the prize simply because now this body is, is, is starting to suffer or now that this body is starting to get old or that you hear creaks and cracks and the doctor is telling you bad news that maybe you've got diabetes, maybe you've got high blood pressure. Passion surpasses all those obstacles. Passion surpasses divorce. For some people when they have divorced, that is the end of the world. For some people when they've been widowed, that is the end of their world. For some people when their children leave home, that's the end of their world. But think of those things as things that discourage you, things that can, you know, um, make you look at life and, 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 and feel sad and feel discouraged. God gives us passion. He says, you have enough passion to see you right through to the end. That's how you see a 90 year old saying, I want to write my, my O levels. I can't go to my deathbed. You know, I can't, I can't die not having at least my, my, my GCE ordinary level. And she will go to school. I've, 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 I've heard of, of, of a lady, I think she was 86 years old and she went and she obtained a college degree. Now that is passion. You know, somebody who says, I don't care what people are going to say. I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to do what the spirit directs me to do. Never mind people's, uh, you know, um, prejudices and never mind even my own idiosyncrasies. I'm going to be a person who's going to do what needs to be done. Now, when we're looking at passion, I immediately remember Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10. And that joins to what I was saying yesterday. And that verse says, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with all your heart. Now, I've, I think I've mentioned this before, that we have Christians and we have human beings who do things, okay? Uh, and then we have Christians or human beings who do things with all their heart. And the difference there is the word diligence. You know, when a person is diligent, they will stop at nothing. They will do everything that they need to do to get the task done. They will not look at obstacles as uh, uh, discouragements or as things that are uh, directing them to stop. They're actually going to look at the uh, uh, obstacles and put those obstacles in the right frame to say, oh, you know what? This is really actually the devil's uh, 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 obstacles and where the devil is going to try and put obstacles, he has seen that there is gold there. So I'm not going to let go of my gold. Now, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with all your might. And you know what it goes for <laughs> further to say? It says, because in the grave where you're going, there is no plan. There, there is nothing there for you, you know, if I'm to paraphrase, that you'd better do whatever you need to do now that you're alive. Now, like I said yesterday, it doesn't bother me that you are 43 years old or, you know, that your hair has started going white or that you are, you know, 59 or 67 or 70 something. That doesn't really bother me. What bothers me is, are you doing everything according to, uh, according to the best of your ability? And God has placed in us greater ability than we can ever actually imagine. And he, you know, and this refers to what we said yesterday, said do everything that you can do now. Why? Because there will be plenty of time to sleep in the grave. 
And this is exactly what this verse is saying. To say, do it now and do it to the best of your ability. Don't be a person who regrets. In fact, if there's anything that um, elderly people, and normally they've, you know, they've, they've studied people who are 90 years and above, and if they ask them if they had any regrets in life, you know, the most common regret that is found amongst the elderly who are over 90 is that they did not do what they should have done with the time that God gave them, all right? Uh, and that, uh, or that they did something that they shouldn't have done with the time that God gave them. So people are always looking back and looking at time to say, what did I do? Did I do it to the best of my ability? If I put in more effort, if I tried a bit, you know, a little more, what could have come out of it? And I wouldn't want you to be that person who's looking back and thinking, yeah, you know, I, I could have done a little more. I could have done a little more. Right. Now, when you are dealing with passion, I have to introduce this, this, uh, you know, this, uh, 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 maybe let me call it a phenomenon. Okay. You see, the challenge we have is with people who are content on jobs. Okay. Let me say that again. The challenge that we have are with people who are happy to be employed by someone else and they are not providing employment themselves. And why that is a challenge is because uh, you can never be a millionaire on a salary. Let me try and expound that a bit with a story that I heard a preacher um, speak. This, this preacher said, you know, he's, 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 he's an international uh, a preacher and quite a businessman, quite well established and everything. And um, he, he bumped into an Indian tycoon uh, in, 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 in the lounge by the, by the uh, airport. And they got to chat. Okay, this is a tycoon, and I'm talking of a billionaire, not just a millionaire. And when he saw this tycoon, he, he recognized him that so this is that gentleman who runs this and that uh, construction company. And he asked him, he says, look, tell me something. It seems to me, this is the, the, the black preacher, okay? And he's asking this Indian tycoon and says, tell me something. It seems to me that every time black people get up from their original uh, 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 place of abode, or their residence, their, their original country, and they go to another country to resettle. They just sort of get by, you know? They, they, they get enough to put food on the table, you know, to pay the bills, send the kids to school. But they never quite make anything great out of themselves. And this is, if it's from Zimbabwe or from Africa, this is if you're gonna go to South Africa, if you're gonna go to the UK, to Canada, to the US, uh, Australia, you name it. It is consistent for all black people that when they go there, they are just about average, you know, they get by. Then he said, but however, I look at Asians and I say Asians, when they leave the original country of abode, right? And that is a Chinese guy. That's a Japanese guy. That's a Korean guy. That's a, an Indian guy. When they leave India and they go and they resettle in another country, they make it big. Why? Now I'm not saying all of them make it big, but the majority of them are very comfortable. They can buy properties, you know, they can invest uh, overseas, they can do all kinds of things. And he says, can you tell me perhaps something uh, that could be a reason for that? And the Indian tycoon said, oh, well, you know, uh, that's not a hard question to answer. I'll, I'll ask you two questions. If you answer those questions, you've got your answers. So he said, tell me, what is the one thing that a black person looks for when they leave Zambia, when they leave Kenya, when they leave Jamaica, and they go to the UK? What's the first thing they look for? And the preacher was honest. He said, a job. 
He says, yes. They look for a job. They say, please, don't forget to carry your certificates. Photocopy them. Have them notarized and certified, okay, for use when you go there. And then he said, now tell me, the Asian man, when he leaves his country of abode, what is the first thing he looks for? And the preacher nodded his head and he said, yeah, a business. And the tycoon said, well, that's your answer. That's your answer. You can never be a millionaire on a salary. As long as somebody else is employing you, they are telling you what you are worth. They are describing your value in this world, what you work for and what you wait for at the end of the month. They're the ones that tell you what you are worth. And you know something? If you are working for someone, you know, this is something I like to explain. Uh, if you're running a business, salaries and wages, they are not on the side of profits. Even if it is the government and you're a civil servant, right? When the government is doing a budget, they will always, um, they are so like a days ago and they drag their feet about increasing civil servant salaries. Why? Because salaries are on the side of expenses when you're looking at your budgets. So if I'm a prudent business woman, I will always try and keep my expenses low. Because if I keep my expenses low, my profits are going to be high. And then I can benefit something. So when you're asking for an increase in your salary from me, it's like you're asking for money from my pocket. There's already a bit of a problem there between you and me. And so uh, when you are working for someone, I like to say actually that they, every salary that they pay you at the end of the month is a bribe to forget your dreams. You see, when you find your purpose, I said when you find your purpose and you're working towards your purpose, money follows that purpose. Money always will follow that purpose. Why? Because God invests in ventures that uh, benefit you directly or that you have begun, that you have pioneered. And what I want to, uh, you know, implore everybody today uh, to have, you know, is a paradigm shift in terms of how you are approaching your life. I'd like us to have this ownership mentality that the Asians have. They don't really like to work for anybody. I've never seen a Chinese guy come in and look for a job. Do you know what I mean? They're there to construct. They're being supported by their government. Yes, you know, you've got the Indian guy. You've got, they've got small little shops. If you have downtown, it's Indian shops. It's Chinese shops. But it's a shark. It's their thing that they own. And when they make a profit, the dividend goes to them. And so they can basically eat what they kill. But when you're working for someone, it's, 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 it's really, really hard. And I like to give this example where I am only available and I wish to be available for ministry because I am running a law practice. I'm not employed by lawyers. I am the one who employs and with my partners, I've got four partners, we employ about eight or nine other lawyers. And uh, when those lawyers wish to take leave from work, they will apply for leave. Let me just give you an example of my uh, uh, PA. My PA will come to me and say, ma'am, I'm thinking of taking my leave in the third week of October, what do you think? And I'll say, okay, let me check my diary. And I look at my diary and I've got court and I'm going to be away. And I said, no, look for other dates because I'm going to need you during those days. But when I want leave, I write a memo to my partners. And I say, you know what? I'm going to be in the UK. I don't even need to tell them I'll be in the UK. I'm just going to be away for two weeks or for a month. Okay, so I've set my diary, I've cleared my desk and everything, and they cannot say yes or no. They will not say yay or nay. They will say noted. 
Why? Because they do not determine my diary. Because I run my own practice. And so a lot of us uh, compromise our opportunities, even for ministry, because we are waiting to get uh, you know, off days or leave days from work. Some people don't even go to the Zimbabwe day. Some people don't go to camp meeting because they have to be working. And that's a fact. And already that should tell you that is a problem. Let me take you to Exodus um, chapter 20. <clears throat> if you read verse 10, I think, which is the one that talks about um, the, the, the fourth command. There's so much to learn from the fourth commandment, you know. But God says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, and in it uh, thou shalt do no work. Then he, he starts to be more specific about whom we should make sure is not doing work on the Sabbath. And he says, thy, thy, thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant. I said, stop right there. So the Sabbath law presupposes that there are people working for you. It presupposes that you have people under your control whom you can direct to keep the Sabbath. So the fourth commandment does not say, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy boss. Do you understand? So already, if you're a person who is in employment over a certain period, I mean, sorry, over a certain age, my sure belief is that there is something wrong with the picture. Because whatever uh, profit is supposed to come out, out of the effort that you're putting in is going into someone else's pocket. It might be going into your boss's pocket. I don't know where you work. It might be going into the government's coffers. And then they're paying you change. And, you know, uh, then they give you these long service awards to say you have worked for 30 years for this British government. We are going to give you, you know, a check maybe for 5,000 pounds and a pat on the back and you go home and you have sold your dream to this government. Now, I'm not judging anybody who has moved out of their original country of abode. We still actually have problems with people who remain in Africa and still cannot move away from the mentality of uh, being employed by somebody else. People don't have ownership mentality and that's why Africans cannot rise to the fullness of their potential because we are hemmed in by our bosses. We are hemmed in by the NHS. They tell us what to do. They tell us how many hours to work. They barely give us time to relax, time to enjoy time with the children and the family to the point that by the time you are done, you are spent, you're too tired to even think, oh, what project shall I start? Saints, I know that I'm speaking in very strong terms. But I need us very quickly to get to a place where we have ownership mentality, the mentality of owning something. And you'll notice that the more that you actually uh, start to think differently, the less we as Africans are going to be thinking of financial aid. Why? Because I'm going to start my little project and I'm going to pray for that project. And I'll ask God to inject capital in that project, you know, and I will grow it and I will not show off with money that I have loaned, that I, you know, that I've, that I have borrowed from the bank. I've always said that riding a bicycle that belongs to you is much more honorable than driving a car that's borrowed. Why? Because if it is borrowed, the owner can come and take it anytime. They can forfeit your mortgage. So you are better off with something small. Start with something small. It doesn't have to be something huge that needs huge financing. No. But please start a project. And um, I'll give you just, I'll share with you something that this uh, young elder just impressed me with. I went to a church, one of the... Um, uh, uh, high density suburbs and there was this young elder he was clearly the head elder of the church it was a booming buzzing church you know with 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 a very good attendance perhaps you know 
300 going towards there. And everybody seemed to know what they were doing and they were very happy under this man's leadership. And he went up there and he gave announcements, you know, he was looking sharp like a pin. And he could not have been more than 32 years old, you know, from my own gauging. And we were talking about this same sort of topic. And he uh, then met up with me afterwards. And he was commenting on the things that I was teaching. I totally encourage the opening of businesses. And uh, he says, you know, my sister, what you were saying is actually very true. I said, tell me more. And he said, do you know what I do for a living? And I was expecting you to say, you know, I'm a teacher or, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm something very honorable. But I, I, he said to me, I, I go to Mbare. Mbare is the vegetable market. He says, I order my bananas, my apples, my plums. And I put them in a cart. You know, and the carts that you have here are not fancy. They're just carts. And I walk around the whole of Harare selling my fruits. And from the money that I have made from selling my fruits, I have bought myself a stand. My wife and I have built a four roomed house. We are hoping that if we put together some more money, we will extend it by two more rooms and I'm able to send my children to school. I said, bless you, my brother. I was so shocked. I mean, if you saw how sharp he was looking and the job that he does, I said, wow, you know what? May God bless the little that you have and make it great because you are a great man you just don't have you know um um you don't you don't you don't have uh the money that you should have you don't have the fame that belongs to you not yet but because you're such a faithful pe person with the little that god has given you oh may god just expedite and speed you know your personal success as he was talking, another lady came, <coughs> excuse me. And she was the one who was choristering the whole day. And she was, you know, overhearing what was being said. And she came and she said, you know what this elder is saying? It's true. I said, oh, okay. And she said, you know, when you, when you were telling us that we need to start small, we need to start with what we have, like what God asked um, uh, Moses. He said, what do you have in your hand? God likes to use the things we have in our hands. He's not saying go to the bank and borrow money. No, start with what you have. Don't choke yourself with debt. And she said, I have a sister who was laid off from a bank. And there was this certain uh, um, white lady who invited her to do a project of making um, um, crackers and selling crackers. So she was very happy to go and do that. But unfortunately, before they started the project, this lady uh, was, was recalled uh, back to work. And so she was telling her younger sister, this is the younger sister I was talking to and said, oh, I can't do that with that lady anymore because I've been called back to work. And so this lady said, I was interested. I said, well, you're going back to work, but I'm not doing anything. So she went to the same white lady and said, could I stand in her place and do the project? And the white lady said, no, I'm not interested. Sorry, I wanted your older sister because she's the one I know. And, you know, much as this lady was disappointed, she still would not give up. And she said to the white lady, do you think you can give me the recipe? And the lady said, yeah, sure, of course. So she gave her the recipe. She said, I looked at the recipe. It was the simplest recipe ever. It required very little ingredients. So she said, I went into my kitchen and I checked, I opened my cupboards and I saw half a kg of flour. She took a bit of salt, you know, she took a bit of, you know, um, what's name? She had a raising agent and a bit of oil and she put together everything. And she says, I think I can start something. I don't need to start with a whole batch. I can start with two or three and see how it moves. And you know what? Long story cut short, she said, I went to this elder because I didn't know where to sell my crackers when I made them. I liked them, but I didn't know where to sell. So I went to my head elder and I said, elder, you're the one who goes around town 
as you're going around town and selling your fruits, do you think you can also sell my crackers? She says, Elder said yes. And when he went with the crackers, he came back with nothing but money. And she says, now I actually have four or five guys with carts who sell my crackers. Now I have people bothering me to say they want the supplies on Sabbath. And I told them, sorry, I can't do this on the Sabbath. And I'm having an opportunity to tell people about the Sabbath and about God. I was just, you know, I was flabbergasted at that church. I said, thank you, Lord, for people who can take a chance. Now, understand me very carefully. I am not saying anybody who is working is doing something wrong. No. But if you are working for someone, if you're employment and you have an employer and you're not the one who's employing or you're not the one running your own business, remember that your work or your job, in fact, your job is a university on a salary. Always remember that while I am here, I am learning how to run my own business. While I am here, they are paying me. While I'm giving service for a little while, I'm not here forever because I have my own life work, which feeds into my purpose that God is expecting me to eventually get into. And when I start my work, then God becomes my partner. Sometimes it's hard for God to be a partner of your employee, of, sorry, of your employer. And so God then finds it difficult, you know, when you ask for a, for a salary raise. And I always use this, you know, and I know it might sound, you know, a little frivolous, but think about it. If a school teacher, a primary school teacher, prays to God to say, Lord, I need an increase in my salary. God is an orderly God. He's not just going to, you know, round about, bring you money or give you a, a, a salary a, a raise. He's going to have to look at the, the, you know, the president's or the prime minister's salary because it's a government structure. Then it's going to go to the minister of education. Then it's going to go to your headmaster. It's going to go to your head of department. By the time it gets to this poor teacher, it's two pounds. So understand me, when you are working, please go ahead and work and be faithful where you are working. But at the same time, never forget that this workspace that God has given me is just preparing me for what I ought to do. Maybe you need to open a canteen, you know, and serve food to students or whomever. Okay, maybe you need to open a vegetarian restaurant so that you're serving healthy food as opposed to unhealthy food that is being served. Maybe, you know, you, you're, you're supposed to start cake uh, and selling cakes. And I'm just talking about cooking because I'm a woman, forgive me. But maybe you need to, you know, start designing shoes. Maybe you need to, uh, you know, come up with uh, healthy chemicals for natural hair and you will have a ready market with all the black women in the UK. What is it that you must do? I need you to come out of this uh, rut and this system of working for someone and start thinking of how, of what you can contribute to, 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 to this society, which this society does not have. Allow me to give you another example. You know, when I go around uh, preaching, I meet a lot of people and they have so many beautiful testimonies. There's an elderly lady. She could not be less than, you know, 85 years old, very elderly. And uh, she liked me particularly because she's a Maposa as well. So she's like, we have the same totem. So she called me, uh, you know, um, her, 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 her daughter. And uh, so I went to, to this place and uh, I, I visited again, I think after about four months. And I was surprised because she lives in the rural area. So I was surprised to still find her uh, attending church in that district at a district program. And I said to her, ah, oh, Maposa, you are still around. She says, oh, I'm no longer going back to the rural areas. I said, oh, she says, ah, oh, I'm not really feeling too well. And I think I'm advanced in age and it's becoming diff more difficult to, to live alone. I said, oh, okay, that's a good idea. So I've come to live with my daughter and her husband, which was very good, a uh, lovely couple. And uh, she said, but I have something to tell you. I said, do tell me. She says, do you know, 
I am actually running a little business. I said, you are? Tell me about it. She said, I realized while I was visiting my daughter from, you know, from before, that when it gets hot in the summer, there are a lot of mosquitoes in this area. Okay, I don't know about other areas, but in this area, people die of mosquitoes. So she said, since now I, I am now living here, I can be part of the solution of that problem to this community. So she says, I go to the wholesalers and I buy boxes and boxes of mosquito coil, right? And she says, I, I buy uh, like a metal sort of uh, metal wire, which is strong. And she breaks it up into bits and she breaks the mosquito coil and she's, you know, she, she, she fastens it onto that metal wire so that it's something that can be a standalone. And so she makes several of those. And she has marketed to say, I'm selling mosquito coil, but not your normal coil. Um, but this is what I'm doing with it. And you can actually use this as refills. And she says, people are coming in their hordes, <laughs> you know? And wow, this elderly woman who is about 85, quite retired a long time, found a gap in her community. And because there was that gap, she decided to fill it in and to fill it up and money followed her and everybody was coming to say go go do you have coil today do you have coil can i have five can i have ten and she can now contribute to the fiscus of the family and she doesn't feel like she's a burden wow what does that teach us about business when you're looking at you know starting a project and like i said you know honestly you can start a project at any age and you can start making discoveries at any age when you're looking for ideas of a business i don't want you to look next door and say oh so and so does hair or you know and so and so uh, does uh, posters or you know is into printing and whatever you don't need to look at what other people are doing that's always a good indicator of course uh you know but i'll give you this piece of advice. When you're looking for a kind of business to start, I want you to focus on the problems of society. So when you're looking for a business, you're really looking for problems. So don't look for what other people have done already. Look for what people are complaining about and mourning about. So, oh, I wish the government would fix this. Oh, I wish this would happen. Like in our country, we have a healthy number of uh, potholes. And every time you're driving over those portals, people are, they're upset, you know, they're clicking their tongue. They're not happy. They're like, oh, why won't the municipality do something about it? But where I see problems, somebody else sees a business opportunity. I have seen people come with little, you know, bricks and mortar, and they put up a placard to say a donation, please. And they come on my road and they fill in and fill up all those potholes. And because I'm so grateful that my car is being saved from, you know, problems with the suspension, I will take out some money and I will put it into the box of this man. So where someone is seeing a problem, someone is seeing an opportunity. I'll give you another example. Oh, I have to watch my time. I'll give you another example that I noticed I was uh, presenting at, at a certain women's congress, I think three, four years ago. And when I got there and I was up there speaking to the women, I noticed something particularly uh, uh, peculiar. I saw that the women, you know, Adventist ladies love to dress well, okay? And we love to dress well uh, for the Lord's Sabbath best. So on Sabbath, you had all these women, some were in purple, some were in green. But for sure, those who were in green had matching green hats with a yellow rim. And those who were in purple, had matching fancy purple hats with all the fascinators and you name it. And I said, whoa, somebody has made money here because they all looked uniform. And when I inquired, I realized that yes, someone noticed that when you are at camp meeting, these are camp meetings in Africa, you know, um, people are essentially sitting, you know, like on, on flat ground. So those were at the back, 
chances are they won't be able to see what's in the front, especially if people are holding up umbrellas. So I think there was a complaint to say, no umbrellas, we need to see what's, you know, what's, what's, what's at, the, at, at the pulpit. So please, let's not have umbrellas. So a lady said, if people are not gonna have umbrellas and they're sitting in the sun, what do they need? They need wide rimmed hats, which are the color of the Dorcas uniform and the women's ministry's uniform. And she went out and just, you know, extended, added a bit more material to the hats and they sold like hotcakes. What did she do next? She started making little handbags that matched the uniforms and they were selling like hotcakes. If I didn't want it for myself, I'm gonna buy it for my mom or for my aunt or anybody. And so when you open your eyes to see the challenges that people have, there are your opportunities for business. I hope you are with me uh, uh, so far, okay? Now, ah, let me just move on now. What is important when you are starting a business? And I, I'm saying this with all the seriousness that I can master. Because if you are working, remember yesterday the Lord said, you must have your day job but you must have something else you're doing after hours. So don't spend yourself uh, working and working and working. You'll notice that when you're doing your project, your after hours uh, project, you will still, you might even work even more. You might even put in more hours, but you know what? You will be more excited about that. Why? Because it's your thing. I'm a musician. Okay. I'm a legal practitioner and I put in my hours there. Okay. I'm expected at least, to produce so much at the end of the month. But you know, my passion is for music, it's for creativity, it's for making videos, making music, writing songs and everything. And I can wake up at 3 a.m. and do that. And it doesn't bother me at all. Why? Because I'm passionate about it, it is my thing, okay? So when you love to do something, you will not even count how many hours you're, you're, you know, you're putting into that thing. You will not even, you will forget to eat, <laughs> all right? That is what passion is all about. You are so engrossed in this thing and how you want it to be successful that you will see time pass you by without even noticing. And so when you, um, when you are starting a business, please keep your day job. Don't say, Sister Nyari said, oh no, we should start businesses, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to uh, go to work anymore, I'm resigning. No, you can do it in a wiser way. You can carry on with your day job, but in the evening, do not withhold your hand. And remember, when we say evening, it's not a literal evening, it just means it's something that is running concurrent with your job, okay? So you sow your seed in the morning, but you also have other things, you've got other irons in the oven at the same time, because you don't know which one will Will, will prosper. For some people, they do very well. They come to a point where they are so successful in their corporates, they actually get to, you know, to have uh, sh share options and they end up owning the business. And so sometimes indeed, if you have that opportunity, it can work out like that. But sometimes you might end up leaving your job because you need more time for your work. All right. Now, the most important thing that I can say about passion, about being passionate, is faithfulness. Faithfulness. You see, God observes how we handle our business and how we handle the business of other people in order to plan how he can bless you, in order to see what doors to open for you. So God is not really it doesn't really much concentrate on the large things that we do or that we achieve that people recognize. God generally is more concerned with what we do in private. God is more concerned with how faithful we are in the little things. And I will end my discourse with just exploring um, Luke chapter 16, okay? Luke chapter 16, full of so many lessons. If you read from verse 1, it talks about, it's a, it's a, it's a parable of the unfaithful steward. 
Now we all know what the unfaithful steward did. He was doing some shenanigans. There's some skullduggery. And uh, his master found out what he was up to. He was up to no good. So it wasn't a mistake. Uh, you know, he was reported to his master and his master was not happy. And his master called him to come and give an account of himself. Now, this man between the time, you know, during the notice period, and he was told, come on Thursday at 10 o'clock. He sat and he made a plan. And he went around uh, fixing his relationships with his master's debtors. And Jesus says, his master commended the unfaithful steward because he had done wisely. All right. And if we go to, I believe it's a, let me see. I think it's verse, verse eight. It says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Now listen to this amazing words coming out of the mouth of Christ. He says, um, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light now this was a comment a commentary coming from christ so christ had finished the story of the unjust steward he said his master commended him because he had done wisely then christ comes and he looks upon it and he makes a commentary he says for the children of this world in their generation are wiser than the children of light you know that that got my heart beating i'm like christ observed that people who don't even worship god are wiser in their generation than we who claim to be the children of god why because the children of god number one yes generally we tend to be poorer than people of the world not because of anything but it's simply because of wheat you notice here the topic is wisdom, how to handle a bad situation. So we sometimes uh, are so dependent on our Christianity that we expect God to do for us what we ought to do for ourselves. I know that I mentioned this before. And Christ says, hmm, these people, they expect that because they're Christians and because they call upon my name and because I love them, they expect that I'm going to give them everything on a silver platter. That's not going to happen. And because of that, I noticed that those in the world, because they don't have any claims to the Holy Ghost, because they don't have any, you know, uh, 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 false beliefs, that if they take a handkerchief and they rub it on a, you know, on a, on a motor vehicle like a Jeep or a Range Rover, that they have claimed it in the name of Jesus. The Lord looks up from heaven, looks down from heaven and he shakes his head. It's like, oh. When I look at my people who are called by my name and their behavior and their attitude of, you know, having this uh, a false sense of entitlement to things simply because they're Christians. My conclusion is it seems to me that the children of the world who don't even worship God are in their generation wiser than the children of light because they don't have handkerchiefs. They get up in the morning and they make a plan and they work. Wow. They will go to meetings and they will strategize. Uh, are we together? And if there is a challenge, they're going to uh, go and investigate. They're going to research. The challenge with Christians sometimes with us is that whenever we have a problem in our lives, which requires practical resolution. We elevate it to the spiritual level. Not everything has to be elevated to the spiritual level. My sister, if your family is in hunger, the Bible says, go and get another job. Try something else. You'll get more money there. In fact, if I give you the wisdom from my mom, when we were growing up, my mom said, my daughters, let me tell you something. My mom was a skills trainer. So she trained women how to successfully run their homes and their businesses, you know, home economics and everything. So part of what she taught us was, you know what? You must have this kind of budget. You must have daily income 
for daily expenses. And then you must leave your monthly income to monthly expenses. How simple is that? So if you look into your kitchen and you look into your bathroom and you look, you know, uh, in, 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 in your uh, lavatory and you list down the things that are required every day that need to be, you know, replenished every single day, then, excuse me, you must understand that, excuse me, I must have an income that matches my daily needs, not to take from my monthly income to feed my daily needs. So if you need tomatoes every day, you must have something that's giving you an income every day to cover tomatoes. If you need bread and milk, you know, if you need uh, what else is, is needed every day, maybe if it's like soap that's needed every week, then have a weekly income to cover that. Then leave the monthly income to the big timbers, you know, to your mortgage, to, to your uh, gas, uh, you know, um, a, a bill, and to, to, to you know, to, 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 your, to, your, to your debts on the cars or to school fees or, you know, college fees, that kind of thing. That way you manage to stretch your budget. Now, our challenge is we work waiting for that weekly salary. We work waiting for that monthly salary. And that monthly salary must cover everything so that by the time the month ends, we don't have money anymore. If you'd like to take my mom's advice, find a little project, find a little project. I'll tell you, you know, I'll tell you something. I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday, but I, I, at some point I had to start doing cakes. Okay. And right now I'm a lawyer. Yes. And I have a full-time job and I do what I do, but that's not all I do. I realized I, you know, I went to a good school and I, I happen to know English very well. So I, uh, I, I, I review minutes for corporates, okay, like their board minutes. They bring them to me to make sure that they are speak and span, that all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, and that are, they've, they've chosen the right word. And, you know, so that when they're presenting it to their board, you know, management is satisfied and they can just sweep over that and move on to the business of the day. And they pay me for that, for editing. I've edited books. I said, I, I, I will find time. Even after work, I'll find two hours to help edit books. Sometimes I don't charge for that. But sometimes, you know, they will pay me. And it covers those little petties. That means when the, my drawings come, whenever they come, they are not loaded with burdens that are waiting to be expunged. I hope you're with me there, saints. Let's move on quickly. We go to verse 10. Verse 10 of Luke chapter 16 says, He that is faithful in little is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in little is also unjust in much. Ha, wow. You know, uh, I have to just give a bit of time to this so that we understand it. I was saying God concentrates on small things. So before he could commend or recommend Joseph to be the leader of Potiphar's house, right? Uh, he looked closely at how he was performing his slave duties. I say ultimately God saw Joseph and he said, not only is he worth to be is he worthy to be the head of Potiphar's house? This, this, this domain is too small for him. He needs to be the second in charge, the Safnaf Penea of Egypt. What is it that God saw in Joseph that made him so impressed? He was performing slave duties. What are slave duties? All those menial jobs that nobody likes to do. It's when you're mopping, you know, and how well you are drying or washing the mop or whatever it is, how well you're doing that. It's when you're looking after your patients and how well you are doing it off camera, how they feel about how you treat them. 
Do you do it just because it's your job? Or do you do it as unto the Lord? And when God sees how you treat these small things, you know, doing dishes, how do you do dishes? I said, Joseph mopped the floor so well, God said he has to be king. How well are you doing your tiny things? How well are you looking after your family, looking after your wife? How well are you looking after your children? And if we have youths here, how well are you looking after your room? A lot of us are renting houses, right? We're renting houses. How well are you looking after that? And God is looking at how well you're looking after stationery at work. Some people think that the stationery at work when you've been given a pen, it now belongs to you. No, it is for your use, but it still belongs to the company. How many people abuse telephone lines? You know, they'll say, no, no, I'll call you from the land. And I'm sure that systems are different. But I know people who have abused uh, work phones for their personal business. And God says, he who is faithful. I don't look at the big things. I know obviously that if you're faithful in the little things, it's a given you're going to be faithful in the, in the larger things. So I'm not going to look at the larger things. I'm going to look at the small things. And you know what that tells us tonight? It tells us that God only enlarges and increases people who are safe to bless. So when God is observing how well you look after your body, just how hygienic you are, you know, when God looks at how you leave your desk at work, small things. God looks at how you prepare your meals for your husband, uh, my mother. How you present it, do you present it to him as if you are going before a king, as if you're going before the master of the house? Or do you just do it, say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to give it to George. You know, it's, it's him. You know, I'm tired. And God is looking at small things like that. A father, he's looking at how well you remember your wife's birthday. He's looking at, you know, uh, how well you are treating her. Is she a lady? You know, I'm not going to say hold out the door for her, but if you can, why ever not? God is looking at those small things. How are you keeping your car clean? In order to see if you are safe to bless with bigger things. And most of us are still where we are because we have failed on this point. Where we think God is looking at the large things, how much tithe we are returning, and we think that is the faithfulness is looking for. No, that is not what is being said here. God says, yes, be, be faithful. It's actually for your benefit because I will give you a blessing for it. But when I'm thinking of how to increase you and to enlarge your territory, I'm looking at the tiny things. I'm looking at the things that people don't see. I'm looking at faithfulness in the small things. So we understand that ownership begins with stewardship god says let me just finish reading so i can conclude uh i think our time is whoa i think we are way past our time now um this is what he says he says uh in verse 11 if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon and that's money who will commit to you uh, to your trust the true riches and then he says, and if you have not been faithful in that which belongs to another man, who shall uh, give you that which is your own? So God says, I'm going to look at how you look after other people's things in order for me to see whether you should have things that belong to you. So if you cannot be faithful in things of money, ah, we can't even trust you with power. If you cannot be faithful in a house that you are renting, in the pool car at work, if you cannot be faithful to look after even your own body, which does not belong to you, who is going to commit to you true riches? Who's going to give you your things? You know, these are like uh, a rhetorical questions that God asks. He says, so I am busy looking at the small things and I am busy looking at the things that belong to other people that you have been given custody of. If you look after those things well, it will tell me you are ready for your own blessing. So what are we saying about passion today? I'm sure we've, we've expanded it to, you know, all the four corners of the earth. But 
we still go back to the verse which says, whatever your hand findeth to do. Anything. It might be something that doesn't belong to you. God says, be faithful. Look after it as if it's your own. It might be children whom you have been given to look after who are not your natural issue. God is looking at your attitude to those children to say, how are you treating them juxtaposed to your own children, especially if you are in the same home? God is looking at those tiny things. Say, Can this person be trusted with a government position? Can this person be trusted with uh, you know, greater responsibilities when he cannot even look at his brother's child with grace and cannot equalize between those two so that this child does not feel out of place? How can I trust this person with this? A young lady cannot be trusted with a man alone without getting into all kinds of things. How does she expect to have, you know, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, Mr. Miller, you know, as, 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 as her husband. How does a young man who goes around sleeping with women who, who cannot look after that which does not belong to him. How does he want Sister White to be, you know, to be given a wife who is like Sister White? And he prays for, for a wife like Sister White. But God says, I'm looking at how you are handling your affairs now. I'm not looking into the future. And that will determine what I will do for you in the future. Now, saints, I would have loved to do two uh, Ps today. But clearly, our time has run out. Uh, let me conclude by saying this. People with a passion are very rare. And yet, those who do everything with a passion have achieved far greater results than they have ever imagined. Because they will stop at nothing until they have achieved what they need to achieve. If you are to ask me, I am passionate about ministry. Today I had just one of the most horrible days. All right, so busy coming out of this, getting into that. And uh, tomorrow I've even overcommitted myself, you know, beyond the time that I'm going to be with you. So I'm going to be running back and forth, you know. But it is not painful because it comes from the heart. And it is something I know I have to do. I cannot do it enough. And I thank God for this fire that's in my bones to be able to, you know, that allows me to communicate with you and to be of service in various types of ministries. I don't get tired. Even if I, I doze off and I, I conk off, you know, uh, without even knowing, I wake up and I have got a smile on my face because I am doing exactly what I need to be doing. Now I want to ask today, what are you passionate about? Are you just kind of mediocre in the way that you observe everything you do? Do you just do things for the sake of doing it? Do you do the minimum that you need to give? You know, uh, what, what's the minimum that I need to do uh, in order not to be taken to court by my wife for not looking after the children? What's the minimum I can give God in order to escape hellfire? Some of us have got this fire escape, uh, uh, you know, uh, mentality. We, we just think, What's the minimum I need to do in order to get by? And God says, mm -mm. there is nothing like a lazy Christian. There's nothing like a Christian who doesn't have a fire in their bones. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes with so much life. You cannot contain it yourself. Brothers and sisters, I will end here today. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us close our eyes in prayer. Dear Lord in heaven, thank you so much that you were so passionate about this world that that passion spent you. It even took you to death, dear Lord. Thank you for dying for us. And that was your passion for this world that you had created to redeem man whom you created in your own image. Father, that we in this life may have uh, just a portion, just a glimpse of that passion that you had that took you to death. That even our Christianity and our Christian lives may be filled with such passion, Lord, that we will even be ready to die for it because we believe in it so much. I know, Father, that a, a, a Christianity or a belief or a faith that is not worth dying for is not worth living for. 
give us something in our lives that is worth dying for, something that will continue to pursue, Lord, even in spite of any obstacles. That, Lord, when we come out because you promised victory, you said, do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with the righteousness of my right hand. Let that promise be true in our lives. That whenever we face difficulties from family members, from friends, from employers, from neighbors, that Father, we remember that there is victory in the name of Jesus. And that we go on forging ahead. That we are never discouraged. Because we know that we have our eyes on the prize and we know in whom we have believed. Thank you, dear Father, for tonight. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for your presence. Bless us as we rest. Father, wake us up tomorrow ready and refreshed to hear more from your throne of mercy. This is our prayer and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.